Good morning. This is January 8th of 2023. My name is Douglas Griffin. This is my Bible study, which I like to refer to as the unbiased word. That's the attempt to just study the scriptures verse by verse by verse without having a preconceived idea that I might have gotten from a movie or a Sunday school lesson or a sermon or some other teaching. Like, what does the Bible actually say? I just think it's an easier way to learn. Uh, we're in the book of Exodus. We're in Exodus chapter 20. We started in Genesis a couple years ago. Uh, Exodus chapter 20. God has brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, brought them to the base of Mount Sinai, which is actually a range of mountains, but there's one specific mountain, I think the tallest peak. And so um, he's made a deal. I'm going to be your God and you'll be to me a holy nation and a, a treasure above all people and a kingdom of priests. And now he's coming down to tell them, and here's your part of the deal. Uh, he'd already made a covenant with Abraham that they were still a part of. Uh, but that covenant was based on faith. Well, it was based on two, two things. Um, and it was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. But these people were not Abraham. They were, Even though they were sons and daughters of Abraham, they weren't thinking like Abraham because they'd been a couple hundred years in Egypt and kind of had learned Egyptian ways of thinking and doing. So he's having to re-educate them. Um, so he's presenting his part. I mean, their part, his desire for, here's what you need to do in order for us to have this relationship. Uh, not because he's made stuff up, not because God said, oh, you know what? Here's, I need you to wear purple. Not, not because he just had a couple things. Literally, if I'm to be in your presence, these are the things that will keep you from burning up. If I'm to have a relationship with you, these are the things that will keep you alive. Um, but here's the good part. I, I'll rescue you, I'll save you, you'll be, you know, I'll be your God. Uh, but it's like, here's the good thing about fire. It can warm you in your fireplace, it can light the room. Here's the bad part, if you touch it, it's going to burn you. So if you want to be in the dark, that's cool. But if you want to have light, and if you want to have, you know, same thing with electricity. Here's a, electricity will light your house, but here's the bad thing about sticking your fork in the, in the socket there. Uh, so... He's come down and say, here's the bad part. Here's the things you got to do. <laughs> stay, or here's the things you have to stay away from in order not to be um, injured by this relationship. So in Exodus chapter 20, verse 2, I'm just reviewing what we went over last week, and then we'll go to the second half of the chapter. Uh, it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So he's introducing himself. It's so interesting. Let's keep reminding him that I'm the one who did these things. It's so easy for us to forget because God will do some miracle. Oh, Lord, please heal my child. Or, Lord, please give me this job. And then a month later, we forget. We're not grateful any longer. And yeah, yeah, that happened. And it's just easy for us to just subscribe secular reasons for something that happened in our lives. We just, oh, yeah, well, that would happen anyway. And we forget what a miracle it was. So we have to remind them. I brought you out of Egypt. I'm that guy. So, uh, then he divides the law into two parts. Um, and Jesus does the same thing. So the first five verses, second five verses. He presents the law. And, and here are the two parts. In, in, in Matthew 22, 36, Jesus says, they, they say to Jesus, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? So of the ten... Or actually of the 600 and however many. Which, which one's the best? So Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. So the first five verses are about how we should relate to God. Um, Jesus got that from Deuteronomy 6 when Moses was summing up the law. He says... Um, Verse 4, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He's saying there's only one, there's only one God. 
It's not three. Jesus is not an, another God. There's not God, and then Jesus is another God. There's only one God. All those other gods that you want to worship, they don't exist. The Lord our God is just one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the, I mean, no. And now, now you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, every part of you. Your heart, your mind, when you're thinking about God, your strength, meaning when you're doing things, you're doing it out of our love for God. So you have to put your whole self into it. My basketball team was talking about that last night. Here's why we won tonight. We put everything in. You got to be sold out. You got to give 100%. Otherwise, you're not going to win. Right? That's a thing. So God's saying, I want that same thing aimed toward me. So, first five. These are all about loving God. And when we get to number five, you're going to say, that's about loving God? Yes. It's about our relationship with God. Um, so he says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them. You shall not serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. So don't, you shall not make uh, yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that's in above. Don't create, since I'm going to be kind of ethereal, I'm not going to, I can't, manifest myself literally standing next to you because it will burn you up that's going to frustrate you because you want to have something you can hold and touch and and uh so you're going to try to make other gods oh look let's make a fish god let's make a don't 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 no likeness of anything don't bow down to them don't serve them for because for, i'm jealous meaning i i want you all to myself plus they don't exist um, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. At this, the wording of this means that uh, don't swear by God in vain, because that's a, that was a practice all over the Middle East, all over the known world at that time. People were um, would say, "I'm going to do this, so help me God, or God strike me dead," and they would use. You know, I got, I'll pay you back, or Lord, may Lord God strike me. To, uh, they would use God to get their way with people. They, they are, so I, I want you to love me, and, and then I don't want you to take advantage of me. Just use your relationship with me to have your way over other people, to take advantage of other people, and just take my name in vain. If you say you're going to do something because you feel like I have led you to do it, then you need to do it. Because they would say, may God strike me down. If I don't do this thing, and you're just using him lightly. So the second part of this, when he says, um, you should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So if you say, may God strike me down, I, I'll do that. I won't hold you guiltless. I, I, you know, because you're, you're, you're saying, I told you to do that, that I'm giving you shit. You're swearing that. You know, and so I'll make sure consequences come on you then. So don't do that. Uh, and this is, again, our relationship with God. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Sabbath day is my day. There are six days that you're going to worry about food. You're going to worry about work. You're going to worry about all your business. On the seventh day, I want you, that's my day. I want you to worry about everything that I want you to do. I want you to pray about, this is, I want a day where I'm not, selfish i'm not thinking i've got to have this i better I, give me a day where you trust that i'm going to meet your needs and that if i'm saying go to your neighbor and give them a pie go read uh, that science book go do the, that you, you give me at least an entire day dedicated to me that's showing that you love me god wants a date night i want a day about me remember this um then he says honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. That's number five. So why is that? How, what is, how, honor your father and your mother, that feels like it's about other people. That's not about God. Well, God is going to direct you 
through as a child, starting from your child. He's going to direct you. God's going to give your parents direction for you. When we're little kids, our parents know best. Now, there's a point in our life where God gives us our own responsibility for knowing. But when we're children, uh, until a certain age, our parents have wisdom for us from God. They may not have wisdom for themselves. They may be messing up, but they know that you need to eat. They know that you need to go to school. They know, you know, you might look at them and say, but look at you and you don't know what you're doing. But they know what you should be doing because God's going to give them. That's a means of God giving direction to you. So you need to respect authority because that's God just sets in hierarchy so that there's no confusion. I'm going to speak to the pastor to the church. I'm going to speak to your parents, to the child. I'm going to speak to your boss, to you. I'm going to do these things. And if you don't learn to respect authority, you're not going to learn to respect me. If you can't have somebody telling you what to do, if you can't have follow orders and trust that God will make everything work, then you're going to treat me the same way. So the way you treat your parents is learning to treat your parents is the way you're learning to treat me. Honor them. And that's about the relationship with God. Second five, Jesus says uh, in Matthew 22, the second part of it, he says, the second is like it, Matthew 22, 39, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So love the Lord God with all your heart, your mind, so all your emotions, all your thoughts, and all your strength in your doing. Then love your neighbor as yourself. If you wouldn't hurt yourself, you wouldn't lie on yourself, you wouldn't cheat yourself. However you would treat yourself, do the same way with your neighbor. It says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You can divide it in this way. Jesus gets this from Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 17. Because you're thinking, well, but my neighbor's kind of crazy. And she still says, love your neighbor. He didn't say obey your neighbor, because your neighbor might be crazy, right? But, but love them, treat them with respect the same way you would treat yourself. Because we might, I might be crazy, so... I don't need to listen to every thought that comes into my own mind, let alone my neighbor's mind. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, obey God, but love your neighbor. Uh, in Leviticus 19, verse 17, it says, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, your neighbor, your brother. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. Like if he tells you to do something crazy or she tells you to you say, oh, I'm not setting your house on fire so that you can collect insurance. <laughs> I'm not... You can, you don't have to bear sin because of him. But loving someone is not all. It doesn't mean you do every single thing that they say. Loving God means you do everything that he says. That's why he separated this. But it means you don't hate them. You don't, you don't, you're not despising them. You're not warring against them in your mind. Okay, but sometimes loving someone is understand when they're wrong. But loving them for it. Uh, he says, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord, meaning he leaves it, leaves it with, I am the Lord. So, so, so let it be written, so let it be done. Make it so. I am the Lord. Uh, and so these are the five ways that he tells us to do it in, in, in commandments 6 through 10. You shall not murder. That's a good one. Don't go around killing people. That's not, that, that's going to, it's going to cause a lot of um, grumbling in your neighborhood. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. So don't lie. Don't steal. And you shall not covet your neighbor's house. Your neighbor. No, you shall covet your neighbor's wife. Your neighbor's male servant, female servant. Whatever, however I bless them. That's how I bless them. Recognize how I blessed you, and. Then you won't steal from them. You won't murder them if you don't allow that to fester in your heart. Okay. So, and Jesus says it's just simple. Love God and love people. That's all God is asking of them because this will lead you away from sin. Sin is, are the things that are going to bring consequences on you. And Jesus, God's saying, I don't want consequences to come on you, but I can't help but give them. Fire can't help but burn you if you touch it. Water can't help but get you wet. I touched the water and my hand got all wet. That's what it does. So certain things have certain properties. And God's saying, I'm a consuming fire. And, and so 
if you do these things, consequences won't come on you. So um, this is for you. It's not just because, oh, I love rules. When a parent is teaching your child to cross the street and take my hand, because the child doesn't understand the car, never driven one, doesn't understand how heavy it is, doesn't understand that the person driving the car may not be paying attention. The child just understands my ball or my pet ran across the street and they, and they don't have a consciousness of that. So you don't go across that street, take my hand. It's not, because I like rules, I just love rules. It's like, to, in order to save your life, I'm doing this to save your life, right? Okay, so that's what God's saying. Here are the rules that will save your life. Next, like says chapter 20, verse 18. Good morning, Rodney and all of you guys. Um, now, all the people witnessed the thunderings. Here's the deal, God came down on purpose in a cloud that was thundering and storming and lightning and he spoke out loud to Moses. So imagine the voice of God speaking out of a cloud. So uh, it's pretty awesome because it fills up the whole universe, right? Um, but he's, I'm doing this on purpose so that people will know, because until then they only got messages from Moses. God said this, God said that, that, do we believe Moses? I know every so often things he does happen, but says happen, but so God's like, I'm gonna actually show up so they can hear that I've talked to you. And then they won't have any doubt. They will just, unless they're crazy, turn out some of them are crazy, they'll know that you're not making stuff up. I'm actually talking to you. Because they'd seen the cloud before lead them and the fire by night lead them, but God had never spoken out of it. So now I'm going to start speaking out of the cloud. And he does. And in the book of Exodus and Numbers, and other, the clouds would show up every so often and people would go, uh oh, here's the cloud. And then God would come and say something or do something. So this is the first time they're seeing God's actually speaking in this form to Moses. So it says, now all the people witnessed the thundering. This is Exodus 20, 18. The lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. So that's the short version of what they said. I want to read from Deuteronomy 5, because... Moses, when he's summing it up, he's reminding them, here's everything you said, here's everything God said. Here's, here's all of it. Because Moses just gives the, it, the basic gist is they stood far off and said, you talk to God, we don't want to talk to God. Uh, that's the wrong reaction, obviously. Um, so, in Deuteronomy 5, here's the whole gist of it. Deuteronomy 5, 23. So it was when you heard the voice from the midst of the darkness while the mountain was burning with fire that you came near to me. All the heads of your tribes and your elders and you said, surely the Lord our God has showed us his glory and his greatness. Wow, he's impressive. And we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God speaks with man. Yet he still lives because it some of us just didn't believe you. What do you mean God's talking to you? How are you alive if God actually spoke to you? Actual God who created the universe spoke to you. You would not be alive. But now we've seen, oh, that is possible. Now, therefore, why should we die, though? I mean, it, uh, we get that God speaks to you and you're living, but we don't feel like dying. For this great fire will consume us, sir. And again, that's like somebody introducing fire to the world and people saying, no, fire is bad. And that, no, fire is, could be good. Fire can keep you warm. Fire can cook your food. Fire can light your house. There's so many good uses for fire. No, bad. Like, well, only if you, yes, there's just one condition. If you fall into the fire, bad. But otherwise, it's this wonderful thing. They're like, no, that fire is going to consume us. We only see bad. If we hear the voice of God, anymore it says then we'll die if he just keeps talking we're gonna die and they're making that up but they all took a vote came to him and said here's what we need to tell you so for well, who was there and they're still talking of all flesh who has heard the voice of the living god speaking from the midst of the fire as we haven't lived no one well uh moses has moses he does you see that he does it every day 
No, no. And as far as some of them are concerned, this is the first time God ever really, really spoke. Moses probably made that other stuff up. But how do we know you're going to stay alive? So they're catastrophizing the whole thing instead of saying, wow, look what God has come and promised to me. Look what God has said he will do. Nope, you don't want it. So you go near and hear all that the Lord our God may say and tell us all that the Lord our God says to you and we will hear it and do it. So we don't want to have a relationship with God. We want you to have a relationship with God. Sometimes we do that with uh, a pastor. You talk to God. You go, and we'll just show up on Sundays. You tell us everything God said, and then we can go about our business. We don't want to actually study the Bible ourselves. That's your job. It's not our job to have a relationship with God. Yes, it is. It's not you talking. You spend hours in prayer. That's not. That's your job, and we'll just hear what you God told you. No, God's giving me direction for the church, but. Your own personal life, God is going to talk to you about your own personal life. I'm just here to talk about the direction of the church, what we should be doing. God's going to talk to you personally. Nah, we don't want to hear it. Okay, but that's why your lives are going to be kind of messed up. Because you don't want to spend the time having a personal relationship with God. And that's what they're telling Moses. You talk to God, you just tell us what he says. We're going to do our thing. Goodbye. So, Moses then says in Deuteronomy 5, uh, then the Lord, I think this is verse 28, then the Lord heard the voice of your words when you spoke to me, and the Lord said to me, I have heard the voice of the words of the people which they have spoken to you, and they are right in all that they have spoken. I am a fire. I actually have, I, they're right, they're, they're wrong in their interpretation of everything, but yes, I am speaking to you, and who has seen, heard my voice and lived, and that, that's but I'm telling them that I'm going to do it, and they're not listening to that part. But everything they've spoken, yeah, they're right. He says, and here's an important verse, verse 29. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep my commandments, that it might be well with them with their children forever. I wish this particular fear of them, of me, would stay in their heart. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments, because that's going to keep them alive. There are people who, for example, drink and drive, which is dangerous because cars are heavy and go fast, and you lose your perception and your timing. And, uh, but on New Year's, when you know they're going to set up blockades and check people, then you don't do it. But the police think, I wish that all year long you would not do it. Uh, there are people who slow down when they come near certain intersections, or, but they're speeding the rest of the time. Or they, And it's like, I wish this fear was always in you because then you wouldn't do these dangerous things, whatever they are, whatever, you know. And God's saying, boy, this fear that you have right now, I think would just stay in you because these consequences are real. Now, as Christians, a lot of times we don't want to use fear on people. We don't want people to not sin because they're scared of God. We want to be like the way Jesus did it. And again, in the three and a half years of his ministry, the first three years, he was all saying, blessed are the poor. And here's all God's going to bless you and seek and knock and the door will be open and ask. Ask and you will find. I think I'm getting them wrong. Seek and the door will be open. Bless my heart. Knock and the door will be open. Seek you'll find. Ask and it will be answered. He's, he's encouraging them to do all these things because God loves you. And, and then in the last six months of his ministry, <clears throat> he realizes that some of these people, I'm going to have to scare into it. So he talks about the judgment of God for the last six months, first three years, love of God. But God is both. But you don't have to um, experience the judgment side if you just are doing the right thing. So if love is what can motivate you to do the right thing, then you're good. You don't have to get pulled over by the police for speeding if you don't speed. Then you're good. So it's, oh, hi, Miss Policeman, and you just keep, and then keep driving because you're doing the right thing. But if it takes getting pulled over to stop you, then okay, then that's fine. And that's what Jesus, okay, now I'm going to have to talk about the judgment part. It's always there. It's always there. Uh, there's certain foods we shouldn't eat or just things we shouldn't do that the doctor says. And as long as we're, if you, 
if you can do it out of love, then great. But if you need fear in order to scare you, and sometimes that happens, you know that picture in the dentist's office and the person only has six teeth left and they're all rotten and green and uh, this will be happening if you don't brush your teeth. You, you, first they show you the beautiful smile. You want that beautiful smile? Yes, then brush your teeth. But sometimes they have to show you the horrible picture because uh, both true. If you don't brush your teeth, that's what's going to turn to. And so God wants to come to us with all this love, but if that's not going to work, then I just, I'll have to use fear because that part's true. That's why in Jude it says, some save with fear. Because some people, that's what, unfortunately, that's what they need. That's the only thing that's going to stop them from doing it. And you might have had children, you parents might have had children that were very obedient because they wanted to be, and others who just were kind of strong-willed that only stopped doing it if they got a little, you know, slap on the hand. Then they're, okay, now I'll stop doing it because I see there's punishment coming for it. So, um... He's saying, I wish this fear then would always be in front of you so that you wouldn't sin. That would be great. I, I, now, God knows what's coming up. I'm going to bring Moses up here. I'm going to lay out all the laws, all the statutes, all the things that they need to do so we can have this great relationship. And I, when they come down, you already have made a, a, an idol and, you you know, <laughs> to be punished. And So I wish you would... You're so scared of me now, but you think I don't exist when you don't see me, which is, you know, that's how we are. The police don't exist if I can't see them. God doesn't exist if I can't see them. My teacher doesn't exist. He left out the, you know, oh, good, they're gone. And that's how we are. So I don't, I don't need to have to burn with fire every second of your life next to you. I would like for you just to trust me and believe me. But I clear you, you're not going to. So if only this fear would stay in front of you and you wouldn't sin, that would be really cool. So everything you said is right. Yes, I am scary. Yes, yes, that is me. And the, and the, yeah, yeah, I think so. And so the teach, you know, uh, when I was teaching school, because I'm funny and all these other things, you know, I had kids who were, oh, I can't wait to get Mr. Grimm's class. So I'd let them know the first day, I will kill you. Uh, you know, I, I don't want you to think, but you don't ever have to see that side of me. <laughs> yeah. But you have to, you know, I'm strict. I would say I would kill you. But, you know, I do have a strict side. So let me show that to you so you know that it's there. But we can have fun the whole time and you never have to see that side. And that's important that we know that that side exists because the person that's just all sweetness and light is can be taken advantage of. You have to know there is another side. But there's no reason to see that side. There's no reason. Okay. So Moses spoke to people back to Exodus 20, and he tells them a little bit of what God said. I mean, in Exodus, he told them the whole thing, but Exodus only records a little bit. So Exodus 20, 20, and Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, that his fear may be before you. That's why he's here, so that you may not sin. So don't be afraid. This is a test to see if his fear will stay with you, because you need some incentive. You don't understand that the sins that you're going to commit are gonna swallow you up and we don't understand that you know the doctor says stop you can't have 15 donuts every day or you can't you know or you, you know what I'm saying we're we have to be warned because some part of us thinks oh I can do that what will happen nothing will happen I can play with these matches not what 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 what's the worst that could happen so I want you to be afraid I want you to say oh I better not do that oh, I better not do it you know so God has come to test you that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin because it's going to hurt you. I'm not making up these rules because I like rules. I'm making up these rules because you are not aware of the consequences and I am. So, uh, and here's what's funny in Exodus chapter 19, verse 8. Before God brought down his part of it, when God simply said to them, I'm going to bless you in all these ways and make you my peculiar treasure above all the people of the earth. In, in Exodus 19, 8, they said, then all the people answered together and said, yes, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So Moses brought back the words of, people to, of the people to the Lord. Yes, we want all of that. We want all the good. Then God shows up and says, okay, well, here's your part. Don't kill each other. Don't steal. What? You said I can't kill and steal. Well, I don't want any part of this then. Okay. So, uh, so Exodus 20, 21, the people stood afar off. But Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. So the people said, okay. Uh, and God, 
if I could just critique God, I wish God would just make us all robots, but he doesn't want a bunch of robots. He wants people to choose to love him. Because, so they stood afar off and God like, that's your choice. That's the God invented choice. That's the first thing you did. Garden of Eden, here's a tree, don't eat it. Here's a thousand other trees that you can eat, but I have to give you a choice. I'm gonna put one tree and say, don't eat that one, eat the other thousand. Uh, so God invents choice. He wants us to choose to love him, just like we want all people to choose to love us. Not anyone we force to love us, we threaten in the love, we, we don't want that. So he allows them to choose. So they just stood far off. He says, okay, it's not going to be good for you. It's not going to work out. But I'm telling you, here's all the good that you can have. And all I'm requiring is that you don't kill each other. But apparently that's too much for you. And they're like, yep, yeah, can't do that. Okay. Now, here was the reaction that should have happened. And here's the reaction. They weren't all 99% of them crazy. There were those there who did love God. But the people generally stood afar off. Uh, but there were others, because there's that crowd thing where, you know, that the crowd can have a sort of peer pressure. The crowd all does something, so you kind of get caught up with the crowd. And you, but that's not really what's going on in your heart. So God knows some of them are going to want to worship me. And some of them are going to be crazy. Uh, so for those who are going to want to worship me, I'm going to give these instructions to Moses. because I've, And then for their children, or for their children's children, I've got to say, here's the way things should be. Even though I'm clear, even though I'm clear that you are not going to be able to fulfill this, I know that the person next to you might be. I know that your child might be, or your grandchildren. So sometimes God is saying, I'm giving you the framework for how it should be, but I know that it, those coming after you are the ones who are going to be able to fulfill this. So here's the response he was respecting. because he, he's, uh, in, in Genesis chapter 12, when God had spoken to Abraham, and God hadn't spoken to anybody in hundreds of years, in generations, the last person he spoke to was Noah, and now it's you know six generations later, the six or twelve. Anyway, he's speaking to Abraham. First time, Abraham, I want you to get up Leave your family, leave everything that you know, and just go. Okay. So Abraham does it because that's how that's Abraham's personality. He's the person, he's the obedient child, the compliant child, right? He's not the defiant one. He's the compliant one. Okay, I'll do that. Then once he got to Canaan, doesn't know where he's going or what he's doing. In in in, in Genesis 12, 7, then the Lord then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. Oh, that's the reward for being obedient. But God, like, be obedient first, and then, it's like when he told the lepers, go to the priest. And then as they went, they got the healing. So sometimes God just wants us, just do it. You don't have to know what the result's going to be. I just want you to know where you're obedient to me. Then the reward comes. So now that you're there, Abraham, and you were obedient, guess what? Here's your reward. To your descendants, I will give this land. And there he built an altar, the Lord who appeared to him. That was his response. You're this God. You're so good. I'm, I want to worship you. I want to sacrifice you. Because I'm a sinner, I recognize I am not worthy of the blessings that you're going to give me. So my response is to sacrifice because I know I'm not worthy of this. Uh, in Abraham, Isaac, his son. His, here's his son. In Genesis chapter 26. Uh, now remember, Abraham has Isaac. He takes Isaac to the mountain, he starts to, he's about to sacrifice him because God, again, is testing his obedience. And Abraham's like, I'm that obedient person. I'm going to do, because whatever God is telling me to do, I know it's all going to work out. So, okay, he wants me to kill Isaac. I guess he's going to raise him from the dead later or something. And I'm good with that. Whatever God wants. Uh, but Isaac doesn't know any of this. Isaac's like, I think my father just tried to kill me. They go from there to Beersheba. That's the next place they go. So Isaac has a bad feeling about Beersheba. Because that's he's thinking about, wow, this God is scary God. I because he not thinking, hey, it didn't happen. God already had another plan. That that test was not about you, Isaac. That test was about Abraham. I think he really internalized all this. That was about me. It's about me. Nope, it wasn't about you. It was about Abraham. God was never gonna let anything happen to you, Isaac. And it took Isaac years to get over that. Finally, in Genesis 26, is the first time he's back to Beersheba. 
in years. And it says in Genesis 26, 23, then he went up from there to Beersheba and the Lord appeared to him the same night. This is the first time that God has spoken to Isaac. Why? Because Isaac's been afraid of God. Isaac's been running from God. Isaac has gone through his own situation. And sometimes we have a traumatic thing in our life. You know, I was, I'm making this up. This not really happened. I was six and I saw a man get killed right in front of me or something. We have some traumatic, and it, and we have the wrong interpretation of that event, and it makes us scared of God, or not talk to God, or not want to be around God, or that pastor did that terrible thing, or that person, and, and so now I don't like God, right? See, did not the coffin catch fire, which is a whole story, but it makes you mad at God. I mean, that's it. It shouldn't, but we blame things on God. So I think has not had a relationship with God, but. Finally, he's on his way back to Beersheba. And sometimes you got to go back and revisit that thing that tore you apart. You know, that let me go back to that thing where I, my relationship with God was breached. Let me go back there. So he goes back to Beersheba. And then God appears to him that same night and says, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not fear. For I, I'm with you. You're with me? I thought you were only with my father. I thought you only had a relationship with my father. But, but, but you love me, but, and it changes him and his response. So he says, for I'm with you, I will bless you, and I'll multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there. Wow, you're going to do this for me? You're coming to bless me? My response is to build an altar to you and to worship you because I'm not worthy. And so I know that there must be a, a blood sacrifice in order for to cover my sin. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve... This blessing, how you're going to, the God of the universe has come down and said he's going to bless me. I, I'm not worthy. And some people think, oh, yeah, I know you're going to do that because I'm worthy of everything you're going to do to me. But the proper response is, wow, look how God is merciful. Every time you wake up in the morning, the proper response is, wow, God woke me up this morning. My, my heart didn't stop. I, I'm not making my heart beat. God is making my heart beat. I I didn't create these lungs. I didn't create these eyes. I can hear. I didn't. I have nothing to do with this. Look how that proper response is to walk around and be grateful all day. But we're not sometimes we're like, well, yeah, I woke up, you know, but where's my Cadillac? And we demand more of God, you know. So Isaac finally has the correct response. Uh, in in Gen Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Okay. In, in Genesis chapter 35, verse 6. So Jacob came to Lutz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. So Jacob had run from his brother Esau. His brother, his parents said, your brother's going to kill you. You better get out of here. So he runs from him. But he, he, his first night, he stops in a place that he calls Bethel, which means the house of God. Beth means house and El means God. Like El Shaddai. Okay. House of God. Um, and he says, if you bring me back here, Lord, if, you, if I make it safe, because he has no idea what's going to happen. He doesn't know if I, Esau's behind him chasing him. He doesn't know if he's going to run into cannibals that eat him. He has no idea because he's never been away from home. But if I make it all the way to my uncle's house and make it back here safely, then I will worship you. So he's finally back there. He comes back. He's got four wives and 12 kids. Like, wow. And a bunch of sheep and kind of like, wow, I wasn't expecting any of this. So Jacob came to Lutz, which is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan. He and all the people who were with him, and he built an altar there. And he called the place El Bethel, God of the house of God. They shortened it just to Bethel because they thought that's kind of redundant. Because there God appeared to him when he fled from the faith of his brother. Because God had appeared to him and said, I will protect you. I'll bring you back. And he says, well, if that's true, if I can believe you, then I'll worship you. So his proper response to look what God has done. He rescued me. He, he brought me back here. He's blessed me. I thought I was going to die. I thought my brother was going to catch it. He promised he would do it. He kept his promise. God didn't tell him to build an altar. He just wanted to build an altar. That was his response. That's the proper response. That's Yes, look how good God is. I need to worship him. I need to, you know, I'm going to, some, some people just tithe, like, I'm going to tithe because, you know, I want it, I can't, all my money that belongs to God and I, the least I can do is give him 
that's like a the response from somebody who loves God. So uh, in Exodus chapter 3, so have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. After Jacob, they're all in Egypt from then on, right? The rest of Jacob's kids, they're in Egypt from then on. And so God rescues them from Egypt. And when he tells them that he's going to rescue them, here's what he says through Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 16. Go and gather the elders of Israel together. This is before he's rescued them. And say to them, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, have appeared to me saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites to a land flowing with milk and honey. I know they're still there, but I'm going to bring you back to that land. I said I was going to do it. Guess what? I'm about to do it next. Then they will heed your voice and you shall come, you and the elders of Israel, to the king of Egypt. And you shall say to him, the Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us. And now please let us go three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Because that's what that's the proper response. You've been in trouble like Jacob was in trouble. You you had no homeland like Abraham didn't have any homeland. You didn't know if I would ever fulfill my promise like Isaac never knew. Is God mad at me? Does he like me? And now all your questions are being answered. I am going to come and do all those things. And so the proper response, because I'm doing it because I'm merciful. I'm not doing it because you earned it. You didn't save up enough green stamps in order for me to, that's an old reference, to, you know, redeem you. I'm doing this out of my mercy. So that you should come and build an altar. That's what, they're going to come and build an altar to me. I just know they're going to come and build an altar to me. So, now that he's done it, and they're at the mountain, and he said, yes, I'm, you're my treasure, you're a kingdom of priests, he's, I'm going to tell you now how to build the altar. So he says, Moses, I've said, here's my part. I know the people are standing afar off, but I know they're going to get over it, and eventually they're going to build an altar. So, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 22, because that's the response. Now that I've done what I said I was going to do. The Lord said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, you have seen that I've talked with you from heaven. You've seen that. You shall not make anything to be with me. Gods of silver or gods of gold, you shall not make for yourself. Anything to be with me. You've seen, I've spoke to you from heaven. None of these other gods, you've never heard them speak. He calls them dumb idols, the UMB idols, meaning they, they're mute. You go, guys, and you worship them. You put fruit at the base of these idols, that, and they never say anything. You heard me talk from heaven. So don't make anything with me. Don't say, oh, but God needs help. Don't carry your rabbit's foot. Don't carry your lucky charms. You don't need all these other things. I don't need any help. God does not need any help. So gods of silver, <laughs> my wife is heckling me because, yes, lucky charms are magically delicious. Uh, gods of silver, gods of gold, you shall not make for yourselves. An altar of earth you shall make for me. And you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep, your oxen, and every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. And this needs to be your response. Wherever I take you, every time you go to a new place, which is what Abraham did. Every time he went to a new place, another, another altar. Another, like, ooh, I've come this far today, another altar. We don't get to love God uh, on our 20th birthday. Oh, thank you, God. And then not think of him again for 50 years. We need to keep building altars to God. Keep thanking him. Wow, another year. Ooh, I had a birthday. Another year. Thank you, God. Ooh, I, I've, I, it's New Year's. It's this. It's Easter. Another. Let me just stop and thank you again. Another Sunday. Another day. You're going to keep build everywhere, he says, every place where I, where, uh, where I record my name, I will come to you, and I will bless you, and this should be your response. However, here's how you should make the altar. And if you make me an altar of stone, so I want you to make it out of earth, right, that I've already created. If you make one of stone, if you decide I'm going to make an altar of stone, you shall not... Build it of hewn stone. Don't take the stone and chip it away and make it perfect, because then that's about your effort. Don't you, oh, I'm going to make it just right, and I'm going to build it here, and I'll chip this area here, and I'll make it square, and it'll be so nice. No, nope. just look at what I've done, and take the stones that I've done, and just build the altar, because it doesn't have to be perfect. But I want it to be about my work. You can gather my stones. That was the problem with Abel and Cain in the beginning. Cain's trying to say, look what I did, Lord. See how I grew. 
I grew these plants and I, you know, and this guy's like, I didn't ask for that. I, these sheep that you did not have anything to do with, that's what you need to bring to me, but not your works. So he says, if you build an altar out of stone, it can't, it can't be anything that you've touched. For if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. If you try to shape it in your image, if you try to say, look how I did this, you profaned it. Nor shall you go up by steps to me, to my altar, that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. So let's talk about that. Because and that, because that's the, the last part. I just want to explain that. Um, they like to build altars up high so that everybody could see the priest when he's done it. Because they're not all literally going to go up to the altar at this time. Some priest is going to go up for them, and they're all going to gather. So just like at church, you know, they put the pulpit. It's raised a little bit, all right, on a stage. When you go anywhere, the performer's raised, you can see it. So don't go up steps. So he's saying, don't do that. I know that's going to be your temptation. Why? Because at this time, they just wore robes. They did not have underwear. They didn't wear. Underwear was not a, a thing that had been created yet. So I don't want you to go up the steps and then the wind blows on one of these mountaintops and then we see your business. That your nakedness might be exposed on it. This goes back to the Garden of Eden. Because the first thing that happened when Adam and Eve sinned, because before this time, they've been clothed in the glory of God. They're clothed in the glory of God. They're not, they, they have no consciousness of themselves. They have no consciousness of sin. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is not some, there's not some fruit somewhere. If you eat this fruit, suddenly you, you have knowledge of good and evil. It's the act of making a choice to disobey God where you're deciding that you know what is good, you know what is evil. So, like, there wasn't a fruit that made you live forever and a fruit that made you die. It was the act of it. I'm, I've told you what to do, and I'm. did you listen to me or not? Did you do what I said to do or not? And so once they decided, we know good and evil, they became sin-conscious, self-conscious, body-conscious, and this is... I'm. And their nakedness is exposed, right? They'd always been naked, but they're not noticing anything because they're just focused on God. Now that they've eliminated God from, God, we don't listen to you anymore. We make our own choices. The first thing they do, okay, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? Now he knows where he is. He just wants God to, Adam to admit that he's hiding. So he says, I, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. <clears throat> this is the first time Adam's been afraid of God ever. But now he's, because he's decided, I'm my own person. I do my own thing. I make choices. I don't have to listen to that God. Now he, there's a fear. There's a distance. And he's died spiritually. And things are now, have a, a different, um, re, he has a different reaction to, him, to them. And God says to him, who told you you were naked? Uh, and because he, he's wanting to think, so you see how the, it's changed, right? You, things are suddenly evil to you and nasty to you, and, and <coughs> they have a different meaning. So where I gave you this knife to peel fruit, I'm making this up, you now look at the knife and you want to kill somebody with it. Same knife. But because you listen to your flesh now, things have this uh, different connotation for you. Where I was giving you fire to warm yourself, you're now thinking, ooh, I'm going to use this fire and I'm going to burn that person. <laughs> you, you, you have a different connotation. And so your own nakedness was the first thing that now you look at the body and you see evil and you're going to use it for evil. So that first sin was nakedness. When you're dealing with me, I don't want you to be reminded of that nakedness that happened. I want you to clothe yourself again in the robes that I give you so you're clothed again in righteousness so that when you're coming to me, it's not about you. It's not about self-consciousness. It's not about you thinking, oh yeah, my body. I don't want you to be body conscious. I want you to be God conscious when you're doing this act. 
in X. So that's why in Exodus chapter 28, we're only in chapter 20, verse 42. Thank you. It says, you shall not make, no, here's a law that, so Exodus 28, 42, God invents underwear. Exodus chapter 28, 42, I mean, for the whole earth, no one on earth had underwear until the sin. Exodus chapter 28, verse 42, it says, and you shall make for them linen trousers to cover their nakedness, and they shall reach from the waist to the thighs. And they're going, what? I've never heard of that before. Yes. Because you keep going up. I told you not to. And you keep letting the wind blow up your skirt. And and so I'm going to have to put you in underwear because something's wrong with you. So, um, and this was the men. So, so, uh, because I want this to be about me. Don't make the altar that you've built. Don't make the stones that you've carved. Don't go up there and let the wind blow up your skirt. Don't, because don't make it about you. This needs to be about me. Because that's the problem. You're making everything about you and you're not able to hear my voice. So the first thing he says is you're going to build an altar. Now he's about to give rules. And I'm going to explain all these because a lot of people don't like the cheats and these next 10 chapters of Exodus because of so many rules, but there's a meaning for all of it. God's not just saying, and I want you to have a sanctuary because I like sanctuary, and I want you to have a priest because that would be fun. There's a principle that he's teaching in each of these about our relationship with him, right? So this whole thing about the altar, I don't want you to get the glory for the altar. I want you to look at what I have done and worship me for it. Don't. Because too many often times we're going to pat ourselves in the back. Look what I did for God. And I was like, mm, you don't you need to be alive and able to do that if I've not put breath in your body. So don't make it about you. And that's just the principle that we need to carry forever. Uh, if anything I've said has made sense to you today, that's because of God. <laughs> not Clearly not because of me, because something's wrong with me. So uh, God gets all the glory. He wants all the glory. That's what we need to do. I'm going to stop there. And... Um, but in an hour and 15 minutes, I will be preaching at my church. Um, I'm in 1 Samuel chapter 10. So I've been going through Book of Samuel, just like going through Exodus, like I'm going through John on Wednesday. So if so, Dottie and Donna and, and Richard Gaines, and some of you who like to listen in, um, uh, please tune in. Because uh, it's, 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 it's always interesting to me. It's always interesting to me. So thank you again very much for listening in. And I will uh, talk to you on Wednesday, or I'll see some of you in an hour and 15 minutes, uh, or some of you next Sunday. And I really appreciate you take the time to listen. All right. Bye-bye.